So I want to begin this morning with uh, a, a, just a slight uh, rehearsal from last week. We were talking about Jesus is Lord. How many know Jesus is Lord? Amen. He truly is Lord. Whether he is your Lord or not is a decision that you have to make. But he's Lord no matter what you decide. He's still your Lord whether you choose him to be or not. But if you choose him to be, there's blessings. Amen. We'll get into this in just a minute. He is Lord. Remember, we talked about the word Lord and what it means. Lord means owner. Master or owner. Jesus is the owner of all things. For everything that has been created, he made. Therefore, he's the owner of it. He is your owner today. Hallelujah. And last week I made a few statements and I'm going to make them again because they, they bear uh, the need to be repeated. In this society that we live in, there are some things that we must clarify. There are some things that we must make very clear in this day and hour that we live in. We're talking about Jesus as Lord. In the church, the church has not understood lordship. I'm talking about the church. Most of you have probably been in church for a long time. But yet in the church, we have not understood a king, a kingdom, and lordship. That's why we're talking about this. Why? Because Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is your owner. In a kingdom, the king rules. In a kingdom, we're talking about the kingdom of heaven. In a kingdom, the king rules. Whatever the king says goes. So last week, I went over just a few things with you, and I'm going to rehearse it again. In a kingdom, the citizens have no rights to their own beliefs. Wow, that's pretty powerful. We're talking about the kingdom of heaven. In a kingdom, the citizens have no rights to their own beliefs. In other words, in church, we like to say, well, I have rights. I have the right to believe this or to believe that. No, you do not. Amen. If you're in the kingdom of heaven, your rights are gone. I'm let this sink in. Because we've been taught we have rights. The only right you have comes from the king of kings and the Lord of lords. There is no sexual preference. There is no such thing as gay rights in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. It does not exist. No sexual preference. Well, God made me this way. No, he didn't. If you're in the kingdom of heaven... You have no right to that. We are bound by the laws of heaven. We are bound by the decrees of the king of the kingdom. That's a whole other series that I'm praying about. Amen. There is no such thing as denominational preference in a kingdom. Amen. You, said, you said that last week. I know. And I will say it again. Amen. Why? Because in the kingdom of heaven there is no such thing as Baptist, Methodist, Church of God, Assembly of God, whatever name you want to put on the door, there is no such thing in the kingdom of heaven. Amen. There's only the kingdom. 
And if you're not careful, you get caught up in your denomination and their teachings and their traditions and you lose sight of the kingdom of heaven and what Jesus Christ came to do on this earth. Well, I got a right to pick my church. No, you don't. Not in a kingdom. When Jesus becomes the Lord of your life, you no longer have the right to say, well, I want to go over to this church or I want to go to that church. You don't have that right. The Bible says he plants you. Wow. Wow. Well, Brother Dan, when I get ready, I'll, I'll leave and go to this, whatever church I feel. Well, you do that, and you'll be a rebellious citizen. Right. That's called rebellion. Because he plants you where he wants you. Amen. You, can't, you can't just jump up and decide where you want to go. He has to tell you where to go. Amen. Why? Because he's Lord. Amen. He's the king. Yeah. He decides what you do. Well, I'm not used to that, Brother Dan. I know that. <laughs> That's why we're talking about it. Because in this day, this society, this American culture, we are not used to kingdom theology. There, oh, I'm about to get on There is no such thing as Democrat, Republican, or independent parties in the kingdom of God. They do not exist. Therefore, you have no right to choose. Wow. We're, we're, we're building up for an election in this country. And we got all these people that are Democrat, they're Republican, or they're, they're in between, they're all mixed up, or whatever. If Jesus is Lord, you'll know how to vote. Wow. If Jesus is Lord, it, won't, it really won't matter if it's a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent because you will vote for who he says to vote for. Amen. I'm not big on politics. But I disagree when you go to vote and they ask you, are you Democrat or Republican? Amen. Yeah. I totally disagree because I'm kingdom. <laughs> I'm neither Democrat or Republican. I'm kingdom. I'm for whoever God is for. Yeah. Well, I have to step on some toes. <laughs> last week, see, I didn't take that last week, did I? Last week, I talked about you don't even get to choose your friends in a kingdom. There's no such thing as a choice of friends in a kingdom. The king chooses your friends. Chooses your job. Mm -hmm. If he wants you to be a baker, you're a baker. If he wants you to be a plumber, you're a plumber. Wow, we're not used to this. Amen. I'm talking about a kingdom. You must become familiar with a kingdom mindset so you can understand how the Word of God is trying to show us how to be like Jesus. Jesus understood the kingdom. There, there is no choice of language in a kingdom. You don't get to pick and say, well, I'm English, so I'll speak English. Or I'm French, so I'll speak French. No, there's no such thing in a kingdom. The king determines the language. I think I said last week and that if the French came over and took over the United States, the language would be changed from English to French. Automatic. Why? Because the king determines the language. We're of the kingdom of heaven. There's a new language. It's a new language. You weren't taught this language. It's called a heavenly language. And the only way to get this language is by the Spirit. Amen. The only way to partake of the language of heaven is to be uh, to receive it by the Holy Ghost. Amen. I can't teach it. Amen. As a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you personally have no rights to choice. No rights. Every 
everything in a kingdom is about the king and the kingdom. Everything. Nothing is about you. Nothing is about you. The problem in the world right now and the problem in the church right now is we're all wrapped up in us. My needs, my wants, my desires. The church, the church, the church. You, individual, individual, individual. No, none of that matters. Wow, that seems harsh, doesn't it? We're talking about a kingdom. As long as you're wrapped up in yourself, you'll miss the kingdom. As long as you're wrapped up in your church, you'll miss the kingdom. How many want to see this church grow? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. I believe that. But at the same time, if we're not careful, we'll be internalized on the church and miss what God is really wanting to do in the kingdom. The church will take care of itself as we take care of the kingdom. Amen. Your finances will take care of themselves as you take care of the kingdom. Your situation will be taken care of as you take care of the kingdom. Oh, we got to get into this. Psalms 47. I know you've been waiting on the word. But I had to start with an introduction. Amen. Wow. Amen. I'm excited. Amen. Psalms 47. How much time are you going to give me today? We really got to get through this today. We got a lot to go. Psalms 47, beginning in verse 6. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises unto who? Our King. Our King. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Yeah. Sing ye praises with understanding. Mm -hmm. God reigns over the heathen and he sits upon the throne of his holiness. So what's the church supposed to be doing? Singing praises. To who? The king. The king of what? All the earth. Amen. Now notice, in a kingdom, because he's talking about the king here. You can't be a king unless you have a kingdom. You cannot be a king unless you have a kingdom. So Jesus Christ is the king over all the earth. So he's got a kingdom. It's called the kingdom of heaven. In a kingdom... The people sing about their king and they sing unto their king. Yeah. Hear me now. In a kingdom, the citizens of that kingdom automatically sing unto their king. Yeah. It's a natural instinct. They do not have to come through and blow the trumpets to announce it's time to worship the king. They don't have to. The people automatically worship and praise the king. If you were a part of a kingdom, when you would sit down to eat, you've got to listen to me real close because I'm going to give you a lot of information quick. You, as you sat down to eat in a kingdom, you would automatically, before you took a bite of the food, you would say thanks to the king. Oh, hear me. There are people today who are unwilling to say thanks unto God. They don't understand that the very food that they're eating comes from Him. That if it hadn't been for God, they may not have had anything to eat. But in a kingdom, every citizen, before they take a bite, says thanks to the king. When they get up in the morning to put their clothes on, they pull the clothes out and the clothes 
closet and they say, thanks to the king. Amen. Why? Because the clothes come from the king. Amen. What do you mean, Brother Dan? Everything you wear and everything you eat belongs to him. Amen. So the next time you sit down to eat, which will be here in about two hours, what are you supposed to do? Thank you, Jesus, for this food that I'm about to partake of. You know, we're, we, we pray, but we ask him to bless it. We're all about trying to get him to bless it. He's already blessed it. Amen. He wants you to thank him. Amen. He wants you to recognize that he gave it to you. Mm -hmm. Praise and worship are a natural instinct in the kingdom. There's no pumping it up. You don't have to have a worship team to lead you into worship Amen. when you know the king. Amen. You don't even have to come to church to worship. Amen. You worship before you get here. Amen. As a matter of fact, when you wake up in the morning, you begin to worship him. Amen. Why? Because you thank him for the breath that you got. You thank him for the ability to be alive and to move around. Amen. You're thankful. The king not only owns the kingdom. Hear me now. And we know the kingdom is all of the earth. Because he's the king of all the earth. The king not only owns the kingdom, but he owns everything in the kingdom. Amen. Everything in the kingdom. Including the citizens. Amen. He owns them. But I'm going I'm I'm to stretch you. Are you ready? The citizens are thankful. Hear me now. The citizens are thankful to be in the kingdom. You know, the church, we've taken some things for granted. We've forgotten where we come from. We forgot that it wasn't that long ago that we were lost and undone and we were living in darkness. We were miserable without him. If it had not been for the invitation of the Holy Ghost. Amen. If it had not been for the drawing and the wooing of the Spirit to invite us to come into the kingdom. Yes. Translating us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. If it had not been for that, Amen. we'd still be in darkness. The citizens in a kingdom are thankful to be owned by a king. Wow. Boy, that changes some things. Thankful to be owned. I'm going to go a little deeper. The citizens of the kingdom are thankful that the king has allowed them access into his kingdom. Because the kingdom is all about him, not you. But in a kingdom, there's blessings. Because you become a part of the kingdom, the king can bless you. The citizens are happy to be a subject of the king. A subject of the king. We don't relate well to this. I'm going to break it down a little bit better for you. To be a subject of the king, another word that we would relate to is a slave. Wow. She's enjoying the work. The citizens in a kingdom are happy to be a slave. Boy, we don't understand that. How many of you here want to be a slave? I mean, you know, we, let's be honest. Let's think about it. Because when we think of slavery, we think of being mistreated and abused and all kinds of things. Being made to do things you don't want to do. But the citizens in a kingdom are happy to be a slave for their king. Happy. Can I help you a little bit? In a democracy... Where do we live? 
the United States. What do we have? A democracy. In a democracy, you belong to yourself. You're your own person. You make your own decisions. It's up to you to feed yourself. And it's up to you to clothe yourself. In a democracy. Amen. <clears throat> we don't understand the kingdom. <laughs> Our government has distorted a lot of things in this democracy. They've confused the lines in this democracy. Why? Because what we have created is a bunch of people who are looking for the government to take care of them. That's not democracy. <coughs> democracy is you have the right to take care of yourself. Amen. That's democracy. You have the right to provide for yourself. You have the right to choose for yourself. You have the right to do all these things in a democracy. But not so in a kingdom. Right. I'm trying to help you. You're responsible for food, clothing, and shelter in a democracy. It's not my, it's my uh, uh, responsibility to take care of you, nor is it the government's. Amen. There's no stress in the kingdom. A lot of people are stressing out in the church right now. <laughs> They're looking at this, this uh, 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 election and all that that's going on, and they are stressed out. How do I know? Because some of them keep talking to me about it. <laughs> and they don't get it yet. And I keep asking them, have you listened to my messages? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no. Because <laughs> once you listen, your mind's going to change. We're talking about a kingdom. We're a part of a kingdom. It's bigger than this democracy. Amen. In a kingdom, there's no stress because in a kingdom, the king takes care of his citizens. Amen. See, we're not used to this. We don't understand this. In a kingdom, the citizens or slaves, whatever word you want to use, call their master Lord. Amen. They do it willingly. They do it happily. They are glad to be owned by him. Why? Because the slave or the citizen knows that their master, their owner, is responsible for every need they have. You want to change your whole mentality? Let Jesus be Lord. I'm talking to the church folks right now. I'm not talking to unsaved people. I'm talking to people that have been born again for a season of time. You want to get rid of the anxiety in your life? You want to get rid of the stress that you've been under? I'm telling you how to do it. Make him Lord. Why? Because once he becomes Lord, it's his responsibility to take care of you. So if he's not taking care of you, you have not yet relinquished lordship. Wow, that's heavy. Guess what? I hit everybody. <laughs> Even me. Why? Because there's areas that he's still dealing with me that I've been holding on to. So I know I hit you because if he hit me, I know he hit you. He's no respecter of persons. Right. Amen. Amen. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. I, want, I really want to help us understand the lordship of Jesus. Hallelujah. And I would suggest if, you have, if you've missed a couple of messages, get the CDs, get online, it's on YouTube, it's on Podbean, it's out there. It's on our website. We have a website. YazooCityCOG.com You can go there and you can listen to the messages. Yeah, I'm putting them on there every week. So th this series is already on there, up to date. Matthew chapter 6. And I will, let me say one more thing. It may do you good to hear them again anyway. Mm -hmm. right. I guarantee you, you missed some things. Matthew 6, verse 25. 
Therefore I say unto you. Who's talking? Jesus. Jesus. Therefore I say unto you. Say this. He's talking to me. Well, you didn't get it. He, apparently he's talking to about four or five people in here. <laughs> Therefore I say unto you. Now say it. He's saying unto me. So the words I'm about to speak come from him. Amen. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. Boy, we spend a lot of time worrying about our life. Yes. <coughs> we waste a lot of energy worrying about life. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just worrying about natural life. Look, he's going to break it down a little bit. Take no thought for your life what you will eat. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who don't know where they're going to get their next meal. Mm -hmm. Some of you may be living paycheck to paycheck, and there may be that one or two days where it gets really tight, and you're wondering, what are we going to eat? Mm -hmm. Stomach's growling right now. <laughs> I go to lunch at 11 o'clock every day. That's why. Okay. <laughs> Take no thought for your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor yet for your body. Ooh. Take no thought for what you will eat, what you will drink, or for your body, what you will put on. Uh, how do I say this? Women sometimes stress over what they're going to wear. I wish my wife were here. She tells me every now and then, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> Closet full of clothes, and I have nothing to wear. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. I can't say it's just women because I do that every now and then. <laughs> Take no thought for what you will eat, what you will drink, or for your body, what you're going to put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? In other words, you do not just consist of what you eat, what you drink, or what you wear. There's more to life than that. Amen. Amen. A lot more. But let's look on. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Have you ever watched a bird? They're not, they're not sowing. And they don't go out there and plant a field. To make sure they're going to have something to eat. They don't worry about it. And they don't build it up into a barn. They're not gatherers. Yet your heavenly father feeds them. God made a plan. Amen. He takes care of the birds. Animals are taken care of. Why? Because God has already ordained a plan for everything to be taken care of. Including you. Are you, Matthew 6, verse 26, are you not much better than they? Aren't you better than a bird? Come on, think about it. Does God love the birds more than you? No. He loves you. Verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? Who can add, add anything to themselves by taking thought of themselves? Nobody. You're not going to add anything to your height. Well, I'm too short. I want to be taller. Okay. You're not changing. You can't mentally make yourself change. People who are trying to mentally clean themselves up won't work. Oh, you're going to want to be here tonight. I'm telling you right now, you're going to want to be here tonight. We are going to get on something good tonight. The Lord changed the message last night. So I, I think I already know. But we're going to talk about some really good things. Which of you, by taking thought, can have one cubit unto his stature? And why take you thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They don't toil, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed as one of the lilies. 
Wow. Solomon was known as a very great king. Wealthy. Very wealthy. But yet, he wasn't arrayed as a lily of the field. Think about it. Let's look on. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Wow. So in other words, if you're worried about what you're going to eat, if you're worried about what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear, where you're going to live, where your next job is going to be, worried about your body, he called that little faith. I didn't say it. He said it. Verse 31. Therefore, I love the word of God. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal will we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Wow. You want to know where you're at? If that just hits you, he just got you. After all of these things, what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, all of these things, what you're going to drink, that's what the Gentiles seek out here. In other words, the people that aren't saved. That is the people that aren't in the kingdom. They're seeking what they're going to eat, what they're going to drink, what they're going to wear, where they're going to live, where their next job is. All of these things they're concerned about. After all these things do the Gentiles see. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Amen. God already knows you need food. Why? He created you. He knows you need something to drink because without water you're going to die. Without breath you'll die. He knows you need clothing. He knows you need a house. A dwelling to get you out of the elements. He didn't want you out there under the sun and the rain and all that. The last few days you would have drowned. All that rain. He already knows these needs. Verse 33. But seek ye first. Amen. But seek ye first. Don't be seeking food, water, clothes, shelter, friendship, church, even a spouse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. You can't get away from the kingdom. It's all around you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things. They're necessary things for life. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto who? The citizens. He's going to give you what you need if you seek the kingdom. You see, when you get in the right mentality, I'm not preaching tonight's message. When you get in the right mentality, there's blessings. Yes. Blessings. Blessings. Yes. But you got to seek the kingdom. When your thoughts are thoughts of the kingdom, then food comes. Clothing comes. Jobs come. Wow. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. God will take care of you. Jesus tried to emphasize to the disciples, don't be worried about these things. In other words, he said, why are you worried? 
He wouldn't have talked about it, except the disciples were concerned. How many remember when they had the 5,000 that had been following them, and the disciples come and said, let's send them away to go get something to eat because they've been a long time with us without food or drink. And Jesus said, give you them. 5,000 people. And he told the disciples, the 12, to take care of them. Feed them. The command still stands. The church is supposed to be feeding the multitude. I'm not talking about a food pantry. We're supposed to be feeding them the bread of life. We're supposed to be giving them the water of life. The government of the kingdom will take care of you. Remember what I said, in a democracy, they're not supposed to take care of you. You're supposed to take care of yourself. But in the kingdom of God, God's supposed to take care of you. You were never meant to take care of yourself. Never. He did say to work. He gave you hands to work with. He gave you strength to move. And he told Adam to to, uh, uh, till the ground and to tend to the the garden. That's work. You were designed to work. In other words, to do the things that God has naturally given you to do. And when you do that, he takes care of every need. That's why you can work a job that pays you minimum wage and still have more than enough. That's God. How's that so? I can't figure it out. All I know is that when I make Jesus the Lord of my finances, and I give him 10% back because I recognize he's given it to me in the first place. So I give him his 10%. That 90% seems to go a whole lot further than the 100 did. Never fails. You cannot figure God out. Don't try. In the kingdom, the king takes care of the citizens. This is why the world is doing everything they're doing, trying to be like the kingdom. If a king owns something, you you really want to get this. Anybody owned by Jesus? If a king owns something, then he has the right to change. Some of us have been in need of some changes. There was things in my life that I needed to change a long time ago. And it was a couple of years ago I finally surrendered. I've been preaching since I was 18 years old. And a couple of years ago I surrendered some things. What about you? What are you hanging on to? If the king owns something, he has the right to change it. So therefore, the Spirit of God is constantly working on you, working on you, working on you, working on you. Aren't you glad you got a loving king? Because in all honesty, if he wasn't a righteous king, he would come in and make you change. But we serve a loving king. We serve a righteous king, a just king. And he's the king who wants you to want to change. Even though you need to change, he moves on you. He gives you his thoughts, his ideas about your life. Some of you are here with you right now. He's speaking to you about some things he wants to do in your heart and in your life. Some things he wants to touch and some things he wants to change. You know, he has to change our attitudes. Mm 
Yeah. We have attitudes. God had to change me multiple times. Again, I wish my wife was here. <laughs> because she would tell you that when we first got married, I would not eat chicken on a bone. <laughs> so whenever she wanted to cook chicken, what did that mean? She didn't bone it. Weird. Sounds like you are too. <laughs> uh, that was not an easy thing for her because she didn't understand that. I was one of those finicky eaters. I still am a little bit. Certain things I hate. <laughs> but I did not like to eat anything that I had to get dirty. Being honest. God had to change me. She couldn't. She wanted me to change, but she couldn't change me. Same thing's true with you. I know that's kind of silly, but at the same time, I'm trying to make a point. God had to change me. When we got married, I was of old school, I was of the mentality that I was the head of the house. Meaning, what I thought back then, you do what I say. Thank you, Jesus, for revelation. Amen. 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 Little women say amen. <laughs> because we were taught that. It was a distorted view of truth. I was trying to be godly. I was trying to be the man of the house. I was trying to do what I thought was right, therefore I did it. But God changed me. God brought revelation by his spirit. He nudged and nudged and nudged and pointed me in the right direction until one day I saw. And once my eyes were opened, I've never been the same. That's what he's doing with you. It may seem real simple to you, but that's what's going on. Many times it's uncomfortable. Many things that the Spirit is trying to do in you will be uncomfortable. I no longer treat my wife the same, which hopefully you saw this morning. I recognize a difference that only God could do. Amen. I'm going to ask all the men and all the women to study Genesis chapter 2. I've already asked my wife to do that. All week, I've been telling her Genesis chapter 2. Why? Because there's something in there we've missed. I'm not going to go into it. I just encourage you to study Genesis chapter 2. If a king owns something, he has the right to change it or improve it. God wants to improve you. I can't do it. Your spouse can't do it. But God can do it. And he wants to improve your life. God knows everything about you. He knows every situation in your life. He knows all the things that make you miserable. Mm -hmm. He wants to improve your life. Amen. But he has to be Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. The king has the right to look at your living conditions. The king has the right to look at your living conditions. And say, I don't like it. The king has the right to look at the things that you've been doing in and with your life and say, I'm not happy with that. And I want to make some changes. Amen. Why? Because he's Lord. So in your home, if he's not Lord, get ready. You're going to be miserable. 
you're going to uh, find yourself dealing with things that make you unhappy. If you're married, your spouse will get on your nerves. But when Jesus becomes Lord, he has a way of making things just work out. Amen. He has a way of making two people who make each other miserable happy. Amen. I'm talking about King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because whether you like it or not, even the most perfect couple has things that irritate each other. I guarantee you, if you ask my wife, she could tell you a list of things that I do that irritate her. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. We've not been very long in the Word yet. And we're getting a long ways. I'd need another hour to finish. Maybe two. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> Mark chapter 10. We're on page 3 of 8. Mark 10, beginning in verse 46. <clears throat> I know you've heard this preached before. And they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho, first stop right there. As he, he came to Jericho, and then he went out of Jericho. I'm amazed the king of kings can come into a city and nothing happened. He came in and he left. He came in and he left. Make sure he doesn't come into your dwelling and leave. Make sure that he's not coming into this church and walking straight out. Or your home, or your job, or your family. And they came to Jericho, and, and he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people. Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's the attitude of many in the church. They come to church with that mentality. Please, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on my situation. I see it every day. People come with that mentality. There's that word again. We, by the way, we're talking about mentality tonight. If you haven't picked it up already. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and he said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, internalized. And many charged him that he should hold his peace. But he cried the more a great deal, thou son of David, have mercy on me. When you're in need, truly in need, it doesn't matter who tells you to shut up. It's time for the church to realize that we're too religious. We are too politically correct. We come to church and even though we have a need, we don't cry out to the one that can meet the need. We sat there through the whole service saying, oh, please God, touch me. Touch me, touch me. This man cried out. And when they told him to hush, he cried out more. We need to put aside what everybody thinks about us Amen. and realize who we're looking at. Amen. Jesus. Amen. Let's look on. Verse 49. And Jesus stood still. He's walking through. He walks right out of town. And he's leaving Jericho. And he's got a whole group going with him. And as they're going, Bartimaeus begins to cry out. And the first time, Jesus keeps going. And the people tell him, hush, hold your peace. We want to hear Jesus. Don't you yell out. You're distracting. 
affecting everything. We, we want to see him and hear him. You shut up. He cried out more. And because he kept crying out, Jesus stood still. Sometimes you've got to get his attention. So then what do you need his attention? God wants to know if you're serious. That's right. You say, well, God knows all things. Yes, he does. And he knows when you're serious. He knows when you finally got to the point that you need him more than anything else. He knows. And Jesus stood still and he commanded for Barnabas to be called. Jesus didn't go to him. Oh, hallelujah. See, we're waiting on Jesus to come to us. Come fix my problem, Lord. Come fix my problem. Jesus is calling you to him. You're in a kingdom. The king doesn't come to you. You go to the king. We sang about it this morning. We can come boldly into the throne of grace. That's where the key is. He's giving you access to come to him. Which is what he did right here. He stood still, commanded Bartimaeus to be called, and they called the blind man, saying unto him, Be of good comfort, rise, he calls you. Verse 50. And he, Bartimaeus, knowing that Jesus had called for him, cast away his garment. Take no thought what you will wear. This was a beggar's garment. Beggars wore a beggar's garment. Therefore, everybody who passed by knew he was a beggar. Everybody that passed by knew that he had the right to beg because he wore the garment of begging. He was recognized by the community as a person in need, therefore he wore a garment. So everybody who walked by knew, hey, he has the right to beg, help him. Help him. He can't take care of himself. He can't fend for himself. Help him. He cast away the garment. He rose and he came to Jesus. He got rid of his livelihood. He got rid of his income. He got rid of the only source to take care of his life that he had when Jesus had come. you are hanging on to some things that God's telling you to get rid of. There's some things that are holding you down. There's some things that have been holding you back from going on into the deeper things of God, and God is looking for you to cast them off. Yeah. Wow. I really want to preach on that. And he, casting away his garment, rose, and he came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What will you that I should do unto you? you got to first get an audience with Jesus. Everyone in, of the, of everyone in here has some need today. Some of you have been with the same need for years. And you're wondering, why doesn't God do something about my situation? Have you got his audience? Have you come into the throne room? Have you got him to stop still and ask you, what can he do for you? Ooh. What will you that I should do unto you, Jesus said. And the blind man said, I need wealth. I need a better place to live. I need a better job. Come on. Some people would say I need a better spouse. <laughs> Believe it or not, there are church people with that mentality. 
That is chicken on a bone. <laughs> Thank you. What will you that I would do unto you? And the blind man said, Lord. It didn't matter what he said after that. Hear me. It's not so important what the blind man said after that word. Because when he said, Lord, he said to Jesus, you own me. Do unto me as you want. Why? Because if you own something, you have the right to make changes to it. So by Bartimaeus is saying, Lord, you're my owner. You have the right to do whatever you want to do. But I really would like my sight. Wow. That's all I want. I just really want my sight, Lord. And Jesus said, go your way. Wait a minute. He didn't say he saw. Come on. Jesus didn't touch him. He didn't say a, a, an eloquent prayer. He said, go your way. Some of you are expecting God to do things your way. You want him to, to perform a miracle. You want him to, to change things for your life and for your situation, but you want it on your terms. He's not Lord until you surrender. Bartimaeus didn't say, Lord, I want to come this way. He just said, Lord, I'd like my sight. And Jesus said, go your way. He had not yet received his sight. And Jesus said, go your way. Thy faith hath made you whole. Amen. Boy, somebody need to hear that. Yeah. Right. Amen. Go your way because your faith has made you whole. Amen. What faith? The faith where he recognized he was the Lord. The faith where he recognized that Jesus was the owner of him, total body, everything about him, he owned and had the right to make an improvement. Bartimaeus gave him permission to heal him. God will not heal you till he has permission. Wow. God will not change your finances till he has permission. God will not fix your home till he has permission. God will not fix this church till he has permission. He will not fix this community till he has permission. As long as you're trying to do it, he does not have permission. So if I, in whatever wisdom I may think I have, try to build a church, it will not succeed. If I try to impact this community with what I think I know, I will get nowhere. Just like if my wife had tried to change my eating habits, she would get nowhere. You want to change a person, you pray. She's a praying little woman. The whole time she's deboning chicken. God fix him. You'll have to tell her about this. Bartimaeus was saying, Jesus, you own my eyes. And because you own my eyes, I recognize that you won't leave me to say. <laughs> Why? Because you are the king. You're the owner. And anything you own, you improve. If you have not yet noticed, I'm all about improvement. 
I told, told my son a couple weeks ago, I said, one thing's for sure, whenever God decides to move me on from this church, if he decides to move me, I leave that up to him, I will have a legacy of trying to make improvements. Yeah. Because I'm all about improvements. You take what God gives you and you improve it. Why? Because he's given it to you. You don't set with it. Remember the Occupy Till I Come a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. where he gave unto each ten of them a talent mm -hmm. and one went and buried it. We're not going to do that. No. We're going to take what God gives us and we're going to use it. We're going to improve it. We're going to do something with it. Why? Because he's given it to us to do something with. Yeah. So I'm all about improvements. So what did I talk about last Sunday? we got a wall on the church that's got to be fixed. Right. Outside wall. Yeah. So what are we going to do? We're going to fix it. Amen. Right after I took over as pastor, I started talking about some of the, the wood on the outside of the church, of the parsonage, that's got to be replaced. I said, as soon as uh, spring gets here, what are we going to do? We're going to replace it. Amen. I talked about the windows in the, uh, the parsonage. Guess what? There's some in the church. That need to be replaced. Go, what are we going to do? We're going to replace them. Yes. We're going to make improvements. Because Jesus is the king. He demands improvements. Yes. Wow. I can't stay the same. Neither can you. If you're setting and you're exactly as you were a year, a year ago. Spiritually speaking. Then he's not Lord. Because if Jesus is Lord, he demands improvements. And he's trying to make them. There's some things he wants to change in your life. Bartimaeus said, Lord, my owner, you have the right to do with me as you choose. It's time for the church to recognize Jesus is the Lord. That it doesn't matter where you're at in your walk of life. Doesn't matter how your situation is unfolding or what's going on. <coughs> he's waiting to be Lord. Bartimaeus said, Lord, I want to receive my sight. Jesus said, once he's recognized as Lord, go your way. According to your faith. According to your faith. We talked about it last week. Steps of faith. Last Sunday night. According to your faith. Lord, you're the owner of my life. I recognize you have the right to change me. You have the right to change my desires. I'm stepping on something. You have the right to change my thoughts. My wants. My desires. Because you're Lord. You're Lord. <clears throat> Blindness is not accepted in the kingdom. We're not done. But we're going to stop. Blindness is not accepted in the kingdom of God. And there are some who are physically blind and cannot see. Yet there are many, many, many multitudes in the church who are spiritually blind. That's right. He said, right then, I thought the world was spiritually blind. They are blind. They don't even see that Jesus is their salvation. <laughs> but you've seen that, but yet so many are spiritually blind to what God is trying to do in their life. They are blind and they cannot see all the good things God has planned. Stand with me. Jesus be the Lord of all Jesus be 
I thank you that by the Holy Spirit of God, you will build this church. I thank you, Lord, that by the Spirit of God, you will bring life and that more abundantly, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for health in this church. I thank you for the healing power of God because you are Lord of this church. So we receive your Lordship. We receive the blessings of your Lordship today. I thank you, Father, right now for jobs. New jobs. Oh, hallelujah. I thank you, Lord, for finance. You're blessing us with it right now. And we receive it in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you for the growth that is coming. I thank you for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that you're bringing into these doors. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.